Uh, today we have a very special guest today on the Absolute BS podcast. I'm your host, William McCarthy, and today we have my very good friend, Emilio Ortiz. Ortiz and I, we served together during my second deployment. Uh, was that yours too, or was that your first? That was my first. That was your first? Oh, yeah. okay. So as you know, Emilio, I start every podcast asking four random questions, and cool. so let's just jump right into it. You ready? Yep, let's do it. All right, so the first question is, what is uh, your top three all-time favorite cars and why? Oh, cars. Um, I'd have to say, first off, the uh, Aston Martin DB11. I really love that one. I like how the spoiler, uh, how they engineered it to be mostly a uh, uh, wind kind of spoiler. It has an intake over by the tires, and it creates this artificial spoiler. And the solid one doesn't raise up until you've reached a certain speed. I thought that was just kind of cool. I don't know if it works or not. I don't give a shit. I like it. <laughs> um, so I really like challengers. Um, just the older ones. The newer ones are they're kind of like my car. I have a 300. It's the same car, but it's a different body. But the older ones, they're really light and big for no reason. And they just seem like a lot of fun. And pretty much any old Cadillac. I know you said specific cars, but uh, three yeah, favorite yeah. cars. But, but the old uh, aircraft carrier looking Cadillacs where it's got like a 500 cubic inch V8 in there that gets negative miles to the gallon. I really love those. <laughs> nice. All right. Question number two. What is, um, since I've known you, you've always been super smart and you always had these, what this wealth of information and it always like I'd ask you something and you just uh, give me a random piece of information. So this question I'm excited to hear. Um, what is a random fact or piece of knowledge that you know that you want others to know that they may not know? Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's going to be creative. because it's God damn it. No pressure, right? I'm just going to throw that on me. Okay. Uh, a little bit of a mystery here on this one. Um, Okay, so back when I was discharged in 2012, I got my honorable in August of 2012. Um, I was uh, pursuing a uh, medical discharge and I was being represented along with a lot of other soldiers by the ombudsman at Fort Bliss, this nice lady, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on her name. And so I received my honorable instead of my medical. And she was apparently representing over 300 of us and all of us got thrown out. Uh, I had three days to get out. And they're like, here you go, here's your discharge, leave. So a couple of years later, she made the news, uh, national news, because she resigned in protest over General Pittard's handling of uh, our discharges. And it really, was an un it really was unethical. But, so the weird fact that I'm getting at is that about a year or so after she resigned in protest, she was killed in a one car accident on an empty road that she knew while sober. And there was damage to her car that the police ruled um, unrelated. Uh, so there's just a little fact with a little bit of a mystery there. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't embarrass a general. Yeah. Um, uh, what attached is back to that yeah well, we'll just, just in just in case just in case uh i get shot before the end of this podcast um 
General Pitar had retired and he started working for one of those rent a mercenary organizations. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> Uh, number three, what's your favorite thing about being a dad? Oh, God. Um, honestly, it's just seeing how she learns and progresses, even letting her see my own failures and trying to have her explain things when I point out the good things that other others have done or the bad things that others have done, uh, watching her learn. For example, drinking. Um, she would see me drink regularly with meals and just little bits here and there, one or two, maybe three uh, with dinner, and then we would go home, no big deal. Um, but when we would be out and there would be say a bar at Chili's or whatever, I would point out the drunk person and I would say, how many have they had, do you think, since we've arrived? And she would say something like, well, I've seen them go through five or six and it's only been maybe 45 minutes how are they acting and I would have her ABC through it so she learns uh, responsible consumption she doesn't even like the smell so I don't worry about her drinking early or anything but she learned um, moderation through watching others and explaining what she was seeing and I like knowing that uh, she learned instead of just being told something that she actually understands do you see a lot of you in her? Like, Thankfully, not really. Oh, really? I, I, I tell people, you know, I have an oddly great kid. I have no idea why. Um, I joke about it, but really, uh, uh, I have a very, uh, I've had very simple rules her entire life. Uh, the first one being everything that she woke up with, where everything is, she needs to go to sleep with that. You know, so like no lost excess blood no missing fingers okay that's important <laughs> everything's got to still be in one piece uh she has to learn something every day nice and if she gets in trouble she needs to be able to explain back to me in her own words what happened and why she got in trouble uh, but also uh and a big rule is i i ask myself what would my parents have done in this or that situation and i don't do that you know that's a big rule of mine is i just even if it doesn't make sense like i can't figure out logically what to do i'll just ask like what would they have done okay don't do that i'll try and find the opposite of that and it works that's awesome man and number four uh what is one thing you were uh what is one thing you were good at in the military and one thing that you were not very good at uh, <laughs> we can do it backwards or whatever shit uh, I'm going to get so much crap for this time I'm horrible with time you know this you used to smoke the shit out of me because I was always either on time or within five minutes of being on time which is already late anyway well yeah so <laughs> that embarrassing fact aside no, really, I learned um, uh, something odd about myself. If I don't prep to be two hours early, I can't be on time. It's just how I am. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, but something that I was good at was uh, room clearing, oddly. Uh, for some reason, it just made sense to me. And it was the one thing in basic training that I was good at. And my uh, team and I, we were... Uh, we would end up getting used by the drill sergeants. We would split up uh, among the other teams and try to help them out. Uh, and in AIT, that transferred over as well. Uh, I was chemical and I, I went to Fort Leonard Wood and there were a few guys from Fort Knox there that uh, were in my team or neighboring and they knew about this uh, and they would throw us in with other teams to try and help out. For some reason, I was just kind of randomly good at room clearing. Now, I never got to test it, so I can't say uh, I was really good at it because I never had bullets flying by my head like that. You know, I have had bullets fly by me, but not room clearing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I think like, um, another good th another thing that really stands out is, like, you have a very logical mind. So, like, if I'm getting, like, someone's telling me, like, 
hey, are you going to tell Ortiz to do what, whatever? And then I'm like, damn it, because I know it's fucking <laughs> stupid, but I got to tell Ortiz to do it. And it's like, and then you'd break it, you'd put it back to me like, sorry, yeah, there was, no, that's there fucking was... stupid. And I'm like, I know it's stupid, bro. Like, that's what was one thing I loved yeah. about having you as a soldier is like, we both knew that like some dumb shit happened, like we're yeah. told dumb shit, but we're able to like filter through that and just yeah. Like, but we're still going to pick it apart and give each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laugh at it. There was that one NCO that would work out all the time. I forget his name. He was a E6. And uh, we would go and work out with him, Sergeant Ornelas, and a few others. And he told me that he hated talking with me because I would just war game him, just war game him and give him headaches. And he would say, fucking Ortiz, I hate talking with you. Stop war gaming me. Go over there. So it was it in the B doc or he was in the B doc. He worked in one of the upper computers. I forget I his Soto. name. It was in Soto, right? No, no. Oh, okay. Um, he looked almost Asian and he was oh, like okay. five nine. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. He he didn't stay around all that long. Like I didn't see him the whole time. No. All right. So let's start from the beginning, Ortiz. Tell me where did you grow where did you end up growing up? I am from San Antonio, Texas. Oh, really? I always yeah. thought you were from Albuquerque, or did you just... No, like... I enlisted in Albuquerque. So what ended up happening is I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, uh, St. John Birchman's grade school, St. Anthony High School, and I started at UTSA, and I hated it. I had too much going on in my life, and um, I had kind of a less than interesting childhood, so I was trying to deal with that. And so I, it was not the time for me to be at UTSA at all. And so I, I worked for a bit. I used to do vehicle inspections. I would put the inspection stickers you see in Texas that they used to have for the license plates. I would do that all day, 60 hours a week. And I got tired of it. So I moved to Albuquerque and there I worked hotels. I was an assistant general manager for a while. And um, I needed something better to take care of this new little family that I grew. And so I joined the army from there. Did you have any family that was from in the army too? Um, no, my dad was Navy. Um, I had an, I have two uncles, one uncle that was a Marine and one was in the army. Um, the army one, apparently he was a door gunner on a Huey and uh, Apparently, he was the one that people used to request all the time because his Huey never got hit. Oh, wow. And they never got shot down or anything, no bullet holes. Uh, and, yeah, but no, my dad was Navy and he basically floated around. He was a radar guy and, and they never went anywhere. Okay. Um, do you have any siblings or were you an only child? I have a little brother. Oh, He's okay. four years younger than me. Nice. He, he's still out in Albuquerque. He's a, a banker and a, a professional photographer oh nice you guys still really close we're okay we mostly yeah. chat just online but yeah. um when you were in high school did you do any activities football player or anything or no i was the camera guy water boy and environmental club president oh really yeah so the environmental club wasn't much of anything it was just an excuse to go hang out in this uh storage shed and smoke weed <laughs> <laughs> that was basically it we would, we would maybe twice a year gather a bunch of uh, aluminum cans, go and recycle them, and uh, use the money to buy weed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I, I really liked being the camera guy. Uh, I learned uh, just weird little tricks on how to deal with the old VHS style cameras that weigh maybe about as much as, a, uh, as an M4. Yeah. And, and uh, like, if I open both eyes and one eye is on the view uh, finder, if I match them, then it's going to usually look good on a normal size TV at the time, the CRT screens. Um, and that would work, you know, really well. Uh, being the water boy was the first real workout that I got because I was carrying around jugs of, of uh, water in igloos. And I finally noticed a little bit of a bicep. My, my sophomore year, I was like, wow, what is that? So that got me doing curls with the igloos. And uh, not that it helped in basic, you know, you know, 
but it's still skinny and soft and squishy. What made you want us to do that? Like, just to, would you I didn't want to play football. Or anything? I'm sorry, I, what? I didn't want to play football. You know, oh. I don't like football. You know, it's, it's not my thing. Um, I like anything with wheels and an engine. Yeah. Really? So motorcycles, cars, you know, whatever. But, uh, and now uh, semi trucks, you know, I'm doing the CDL thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, it's just football was never my thing. I did baseball when I was in grade school. I used to play for uh, the, the little Catholic league, whatever they have. Uh, and it, it wasn't my thing either. I don't like playing on large teams and having uh, angry parents screaming at us to do different things. You know, it, yeah. it, 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 it didn't make sense to me. Did you do any college before joining the military? I did a tiny bit. Oh, right. um, other than UTSA, uh, which really didn't amount to much. I went to Albuquerque uh, Technical Vocational Institute. And I got like maybe 10, 11 credits. I don't know. It wasn't yeah. anything. Uh, so, yeah, it was really just the Army that got me the most credits in school. Oh, okay. Um, what else? So where did you end up going to basic? Fort Knox, Kentucky, Fort Knox. with all the spiders. <laughs> that place, it, it, it's mostly clay. So all the uh, sand, all the sand and whatever is red. Um, and there are parts of the base that legitimately get shut down for parts of the year because of the Black Widow or Brown Wreck. I think it's the Black Widow population. Wow. It gets too high. Uh, I remember going through bottles of off every single week and we would go out and spend one night in the field and I'd lose half a bottle because we'd be asleep on this tarp and uh, I would just see the ground moving around me. It, it creeped us all out. So I even during land nav one time in the daytime, uh, my team and I, we walked straight into this monster spider web uh, and I was lead, you know, so I should have noticed it, but I didn't, whatever. Land nav, you don't pay attention. Yeah. So I'm walking and I feel this thing hit my face and I'm like, shit, I just walked into, yep. And I backed up and there's a web and I look up and there's a spider about yay big staring at me. It's like, son of a bitch. And we all just kind of quietly backed up and did this <laughs> long turnaround. Yeah, I remember in basic, we, our big insect was chiggers. By the time I finished oh, basic, God. my hands were all messed up from them. Like they fur yeah. underneath and die. In like, Germany, oh, yeah. my roommate got chiggers. Uh, there was an infestation in some quiet un underground office he worked at and uh, you could hear them clicking underneath his skin so I I, <laughs> I got a bunch of Clorox wipes and I stood in the shower and I literally wiped myself off with Clorox wipes it was disgusting <laughs> and brown reclusives we don't have those in New Hampshire so the first time I was ever introduced to a brown recluse was basic they're like yeah they bite you, your skin falls off. And I was like, what? Like, Yeah, the flesh underneath will start to melt. And yeah, that's crazy. Cool. So where did you go to AIT? Fort Leonard Wood Fort Leonard during Wood. winter. So it was, everything looked white and it was covered in ice. Wow. That land nav, because it's very hilly, I was able to slide down half of it, you know, because it's oh, just, wow. it's covered in, in thick snow. I would sit on my ass and put my hands in front of my crotch so while I'm sliding down, if I hit a tree, I'm not losing a nut. Yeah. But yeah, it was a cool place. I really liked it there. They had the chemical uh, defense training facility there, which is one of the few places. This is not classified. So, but it's one of the few places in the country where they're allowed to uh, use chemical weapons for training purposes. So there's a lot of protection out there. It's so funny because it's supposed to be a quote unquote secret facility. You need a clearance to get into it but they have postcards with pictures of the fucking thing at the gift shop. <laughs> I was like, okay, sure. Let's do that. And circling back, uh, like before you joined the military and like you saw your recruiter, did you know what you kind of wanted to do? Or was it just like, what got, what was your thought process being NBC? Other than um, wanting to get benefits to take care of my family, I really just wanted to prove myself. Uh, you know, I was raised to think that uh, I was an absolute failure if I didn't follow exactly what my parents had planned for me. 
and um, and I didn't follow it. So I was trying to prove myself by doing uh, this military thing, and I I don't like water. I hate water. So I wasn't going to do the Navy. Yeah. And the Marines, I would have had to have waited until October to go. And it's a good thing I didn't sign up because I damn near signed a recon contract and that would have been the worst fucking idea. I would have never made that. Never. <laughs> but the army said, well, we can take you now. And I'm like, okay, cool. So like a month later, I signed up and all I kept hearing from uh, relatives was, we know that you want to do something cool and fun, but you can't do infantry because uh, it doesn't pay afterwards. So try something else. And I qualify for anything. And I'm like, okay, well, chemical sounds fun. I get to deal with nukes maybe. So I signed up for that. And I really wanted to deal with the nukes. I love all that stuff. And it turned out to not pay <laughs> after I got out because you don't get the, the uh, certifications for civilian life, like the hazmat certification and all that. It, it, it doesn't transfer over. So I can decontaminate stuff like crazy and I can teach people how to deal with nuclear response and, and biological response and, and all kinds of stuff, but I cannot do it in the civilian world. How long was your AIT? No, honestly, I can't remember. I think it was like four months. Yeah, I'm the same way. I can never remember. It's, just, it's weird that you mentioned land nav in AIT. I never did any like basic training stuff we did we did like searching for landmines one day because they were keeping us entertained but you guys did you have a uh, drill sergeants in AIT too? yeah we still had drill sergeants um in fact I think either us or the cycle after us were the last ones where there were actual drill sergeants wearing the brown round uh, doing the the care and upkeep of soldiers um but yeah we the whole thing was there were so few of us doing chemical anymore that it was seen as we're gonna have to be at least, we're gonna have to be one chemical soldier for every battalion in the army. So we need to know how to do basically anything. And if we get stuck with infantry, that's gonna count as basically anything. So they always tried to drill into us and it, it, it never worked out this way, but for most of the people that I knew, but um, we were basically infantry quote unquote, you know? So that's how they acted like we were training really we're we tend to end up gophers you know yeah and i remember when i was in you're the second out of two people you're one of two people i knew that were nbc like mm -hmm. and whenever yeah. i we had any um interaction with them was basically handing in masks or going over different equipment and stuff but i'm i know from what you've told me like AIT is no joke dave can you go a little bit more into what it's like yeah so um other than the land nav and, and rehashing a lot of the basic training stuff, because we had to do more intensive medical for responding to biological and chemical events, um, we got to learn how to do smoke machines, which was really cool, because some of those are mounted on the back of Humvees, and one of them has a jet turbine engine attached to it, and a big, uh, internationally illegal to use graphite container because you mix it with basically castor oil and graphite and this grinder uh, shreds the graphite, mixes it with the castor oil, vaporizes it into this black smoke and shoots it out this jet turbine in the back. And what we would do is we'd take these turbines out into the middle of uh, the forest at Leonard Wood and we'd turn them on and smoke the whole area out. So we would hear on the radios like this battalion was out training and they can't do shit because they can't see anything. And uh, we would all just have a great laugh over it. Uh, so we did that. We learned how to set up generators and maintain generators, uh, especially for showers. And we had to learn how to build showers in the field, set up very long uh, decontamination units uh, for changing out gear for personnel that are dealing with uh, chemical and biological response. So if you show up in like your mop four, you have to show up and we do swabs. Uh, you walk into one area, we help you strip off certain things you, and you do certain things at different steps, stripping them off and we're decontaminating and destroying at the same time. 
checking you, checking your eyes at the same time. We'll walk up, flashlight. Okay, they're the same size. Um, and then we help you get into another suit uh, and we'll give you water. You know, we'll make sure your little mask thing is clean. We'll help you clear it out and then we'll give you some water and we'll send you on your way. Uh, it was a lot of that learning how to put testing kits on vehicles and driving through uh, different environments to watch the response of the testing kit outside of the sealed vehicle. Uh, so we know, okay, we just hit this kind of chemical. We got to back up. This area is contaminated and we mark it off. Um, let's see what else. Um, the going stuff, over another um, thing that was like, that really stood out was like, didn't they line you up and put you into like a thing of a live agent that could have killed Yes, you? that's part of what we need to do to graduate. And that's at the, uh, the CDTF building that I told you about. So we literally have to go in into live agent chambers with actual VX nerve agent, which is the deadliest, uh, as far as I, as I remember, it's the deadliest nerve agent in the world. Uh, there's a video somewhere uh, that can't be shown anymore in training because it's so horrific, but basically they gave it to this dog and uh, it nerve agents, all nerve agents, they cause the signal from your brain to your, uh, basically your diaphragm to interrupt. So while you're seizing and your body is breaking bones because your muscles are freaking out, your diaphragm is either, is either having a seizure or it's locked and you're suffocating. So they all suffocate you to death and you're conscious while your body is freaking out, eyes are rolling back, you're aware of everything because you haven't suffocated yet. So we have to be in this chamber with this stuff and the alarms are going off and we have to test it and verify it. Um, and then we go into a different chamber with blister agent, which is exactly what it sounds like. And uh, I forget what the other one was, but. Oh, so when I first heard that you did that, I thought it was just one. I didn't know they do like the different, cause I knew of those two, the nerve and then the blister. And I know there's another one. Yeah, there's so, a whole lot of them. Yeah, it doesn't like break down to all kinds of different like sub, like you can have a mixture of them too. Or something like that like there, there's all kinds of things you can do with it basically um the way i explain it to people is anything that prevents you from breathing is a nerve agent uh, and blister agents they do exactly what you what they sound like but they also do it inside so if you inhale it your lungs just start blistering and you you start to bleed inside your lungs because these blisters rupture and you either drown or suffocate uh, but I, I tell people coffee, okay? Coffee is actually a nerve agent. That's why it's a great pesticide. It, it does the same exact thing to insects and it'll do the same thing to people if you have too much. Your, the signals get too haywire and you can't breathe anymore and you, your heart starts to seize and you suffocate. Oh crap. <laughs> yeah. So you don't drink coffee? Uh, I, I drink a little bit, not <laughs> as much as I used to. But yeah, yeah. I also learned that uh, the alarms are not so reliable. Oh, really? Uh, uh, literally a hot cup of coffee in a styrofoam cup will set off chemical alarms. So you can't trust them. The best alarm that chemical uh, agents agencies around the world still have are canaries. You literally just get a fucking canary, put it in a cage and keep it with you. And if that thing dies, you're, you know, you're in a bad area you're probably already screwed and i remember like just putting mop four gear on by itself fucking sucks and knowing that's like your mos so 90 yeah. percent of the time you're probably wearing that crap like yeah we had to get used to it and get comfortable with it um we had to go on runs in it and it, it's it sucks yeah and like for those who don't know what um, Mop 4 is, it's basically what you picture like end of days when everyone wears the gas mask, head to toe covered yeah. up kind of thing. And yeah, you've got like a chemical hoodie lined with charcoal and it's strapped to uh, charcoal lined uh, baggy chemical pants um, and rubber uh, boots that go over your normal boots and you have gloves and everything has to seal properly in a certain time. So from AIT, Ortiz, you went right to Germany? No, I was a reservist for about six months. Oh, I was okay. out in, yeah, I was out in Albuquerque. I worked at a petroleum unit. I think it was like the 372nd quartermaster petroleum unit. And uh, 
it, it was so weird being there because I found out that I loved it so much that I basically worked for free. I used up my annual time uh, within a short period and I was having to show up and be accounted for, but not get paid because it, it just, I used up all my time. And as an E2, I was the uh, motor pool guy. So I would be out there on my own, uh, maintaining the entire motor pool, driving every Humvee, every LMTV. We also had fuel tankers that are 5,000 gallons with, uh, like it looks like a tractor trailer in the front, but inside it's an LMTV. Mm -hmm. And I would have to get all of these on my own, drive them by myself through Albuquerque, do a turnaround and drive them back to do the driver's test. And I got to work with the mechanics. They were all civilians. So that was cool. I got to learn a lot. Uh, and I, I hung out there for a while, but I loved it too much. So since I ran out of time, I'm like, you know what? I want to do this more. I'll go active duty. And they released me and I did a lateral transfer to Germany. Um, That's when shit got real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I literally got off the bus in Wiesbaden and I shit you not. I got two feet on the ground and there was already a, a, somebody there in civilian clothes. And they said, oh, cool, you're new. I said, yep. They said, where are you going? And I said, the STB over there. They said, cool, you ready to deploy? What? <laughs> that's, that's literally how I found out we were all leaving. <laughs> that's crazy. So, and then when, so when you got there, we deployed and then like, we spent the year there not doing either of our NMLS. We're staring at cameras for, well, I don't yeah. even know how long. Like, how yeah. long was our shifts? Like 12 hours? It was over. Yeah, I know it was did, nighttime. We did on the clock officially like 12 hours. Yeah. Um, and the only chemical stuff I did was with Sergeant Kersey briefly initially to make sure that the stuff arrived and we issued it. Um, and then at the very end, uh, I helped him do some little things for the shipping, but it, it wasn't taken too seriously or as seriously as I was trained uh, to take it. Like we had some of the sensors that are out there um, and they, they actually have radioactive cells inside. So you're supposed to transport these under armed guard and commands were like, no, no just, just get them, bring them inside. I'm like, but you're having me leave things unattended outside. It's a radioactive unit. I need somebody. So Sarn Sproul, they grabbed Sarn Sproul and they said, just stand out there. He's like, all right. And he was Sarn Sproul. He was out there. This is some bullshit. You know, just fucking standing in the dark while I went back and forth with these uh, uh, sensors that are fucking radioactive. Wow. Um, but yeah, we really didn't do our MOSs. You know, the cameras were cool though. I had fun yeah. with that. Yeah, calling up to, you know, was staring at cameras. And then, like, once you learn about everyone so much, it's just like you come up with random conversations that we'd have just to, like, yeah. stay awake yeah. or whatever we could do. Cause, like, it was only, you know, once you learn absolutely everything about an individual, then it's just like, all right, who'd win in a fight of so and so and so and so, mm -hmm. or whatever, just trying to stay awake. Yeah. And then we'd have to, after our shift, go do PT. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really, that was it. Um, I remember there's a video of us. I don't think it still exists, but um, somebody accidentally put it on a zipper computer. So it was never going to see the light of day, but it was you and I alone in the pit dancing to funk music while sitting in the chairs. Nice. It's like, it is a secret video of you and I dancing in the pit. It, that's a little awkward. <laughs> that's awesome that's on the Zipper Network. So it'll yeah. always be there. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay, so what did you do after our first deployment? I'm looking for an endorsement right now. <laughs> so what was your question? Uh, what did you do after our deployment? Because I didn't see you after our first. Yeah, um, I was stuck in, uh, well, I don't want to say stuck in, I was placed in S3 Future Ops. And um, I once I got into the Future Ops section, I loved it. I really tried to own it. It was just myself, a Master Sergeant, and Captain, I think it was Kincheski. Um Is this still 141? I'm sorry? Was this still part of 141? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, 
actually i forget what company it was. well it was it was the oh when they changed over one like special troops battalion already and yeah. yeah um attached to division and i don't yeah that, that's where that tiktok video came from too you know but um yeah i really tried to own that i would do a lot of the logistics i would do all of the travel the major major west told me ortiz i know you're just a specialist but you're going to be the office filter anything from the companies comes to us you need to know regulations and requirements inside and out i don't want to see some bullshit reaching the master sergeant the captain or me and i said well and uh that came in into play later on but i had to learn everything i was the briefing guy in case anybody needed to leave country i did side seat with the captain on uh on the cards because I helped the government credit cards. I helped them sort the paperwork and enter in things. Um, I would travel to places on my own and verify in Germany that there were adequate um, housing areas and training areas were up to spec. I would go and meet range control every so often in different places in Germany. Just little specialist me borrowing the captain's BMW driving across fucking Germany and having to do this and it was great i loved it and for a short while i was even the burn guy um, where i would get the hefty back with all the shredded shit and take it over to the incinerators so that was a few hours of uh nice autobahn time for me you know nice and where did you go from there what happened after that i uh came here to fort bliss you know i'm in el paso now and and that was probably the worst choice I could have made. Um, really, it was so I can spend time with my daughter uh, more because she was here with my parents. This was already after my divorce. But um, I could have, because I was already dating somebody uh, and we were flirting with engagement. Um, I could have just married her and had my kid go somewhere um, and been there. But I chose to delay everything and just come here. And and um, she eventually, my daughter eventually moved in with me. But yeah, Fort Bliss, I still hear it from soldiers. This is the worst fucking place they've ever been. My unit, okay, so I ended up in this unit called the AETF, Army Evaluation Task Force. And we were supposed to test all the incoming technology that companies wanted to sell the Army. And they were so bad at it that the, shortly after my discharge, they had the mission stripped from them. Wow. They, ju they just couldn't do it anymore because it was just not effective. Uh, we had leaks everywhere. I reported a possible spy and it got, it got shoved under the rug. Um, we had, there was a BuzzFeed lady, a uh, reporter that got a job here at some home store and she was able to gather so much intel from conversations that she had uh, a listing, the BuzzFeed article still exists, a listing of technology that we were testing uh, with little pictures and stuff like this, these drones and missile systems before anybody else knew about it. Like it's how bad this unit was with OPSEC. Um, and there was, uh, we wanna go into so much detail, I'm gonna end up getting shot. So the spy that I reported, uh, he had some serious rank. And I think he was a spy because they knew that there was a Russian satellite watching us at certain times when we were going out. And we we're all supposed to hunker down, cover every, everything up and hide. And it was regulation. Wismer knew about this satellite. We we're supposed to hide. Mm -hmm. And we didn't in fact some of us were made to be even busier um so the satellite saw everything and afterwards there was a investigation that started and i had to pass along information uh quietly to investigators and say look this is what they knew because this is what i built to tell them this is what they saw um and it, it ended up uh where i was sent out to an ammo storage facility without cell signal and left there for over 30 hours on guard, me and the tarantulas and a very pissed off NCO. Um, and by the time I was able to get back in the daytime and call the investigators at Wismer, they said, well, we had to drop it because 
you were a no-show, we couldn't talk with you anymore, and you were our primary source. So our leaders told us to drop it. It's like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Jesus. But there was one place there, one small company where I was happy, and the company was shutting down. So I was helping with the shutdown. But I was really happy there because the captain was a former ranger instructor. And he wasn't about proving himself. What he was about is if you want to be there and you do your job, or at least try to, he'll work with you. If you don't want to be there, just let him know. He'll make it easy. He'll help you get out. If you can't meet the standard and you don't have the paperwork to back you up, he'll make it easy. He'll help you get out. And it'll be nice and peaceful. But uh, I was still on profile for taking Inderol for my tremor uh, at the time. So I couldn't do PT tests, but I was a good worker. And we got along great. I had plenty of freedom. I was able to, because I was helping the unit shut down, uh, I was able to go deal with this civilian or that civilian or uh, this office and whatever and say, okay, we got to get this inspection done and the fire extinguishers and whatever. Um, and all I had to do was check in with my NCO and my NCO would tell first sergeant and captain, hey, he's over here. Cool. I got my job done. It was a lot like Germany mm-hmm. where I was trusted. You know, we know you can't do this or that, but you're a good worker. We trust you because you're showing the results. Uh, and I can deal with leadership like that, but the micromanaging leaders or the leaders that take things personal and they're like, well, you know, the needs of the army says, no, no, motherfucker, you're the fucking needs of the army. You decide what the needs of the army are because you're in fucking charge. So people like that, I don't work well with. And unfortunately, that's the dominant leader that you find in roles. Yeah. Um... Did your tremor develop throughout the military or did you have your vote? It got worse during oh. deployment. It started when I was 11. Oh, really? It was, yeah, it was very mild. Um, like I said, things were not cool. And um, so it started when I was about 11. And then during deployment, that's when it really got worse. And it's been gradually getting worse since then. The medications ended up not working so well. Because like Inderol, it diminishes it a tiny bit. But the problem is Inderol is actually a heart medication. It's a beta blocker. Uh, so the tremor thing is a side effect. And that's why you can't work out because you can have a literal fucking heart attack. And it was on my profile. Like, do not make him work out. He's going to have a fucking heart attack. Yeah. Um, and it just wasn't worth it. I was too tired all the time. And yeah, it, it wasn't good. So yeah, I'm stuck with it. And since it's getting worse now, uh, I've noticed that I, if, for example, I play Forza on the Xbox, I'll notice that if I'm uh, really focusing, my head will start to tremor. Or if I'm just doing some kind of task around the house and I have to lean over a little bit, I'll feel my quads shaking. You know, so it, it's frustrating. really it sounds frustrating. Like crazy frustrating. I tell people that, uh, you know, it, it, it's upsetting, but on the plus side, I don't have to worry about a mixed drink settling. And anytime I'm dating somebody, I tell them, you never have to change my batteries. Yeah. <laughs> so going back to um, your last unit, um, that was the, your last unit. And then you, that's where you got your medical profile. And then. Um, yeah. My, well, my profile started in Germany and it okay. just carried over. And then. Um, so they were trying to medically discharge you for that there? Yeah, well, I tried to get them to medically discharge me for that, but they were saying that my my worst symptoms were actually major depressive disorder and anxiety. Um, so I have paperwork literally saying uh, from civilian doctors on base saying um, his command is trying to administratively force him out for issues that he is having related to exactly what he's getting discharged for. And this is unethical, it's against regulation, and it should not be allowed. Yeah. Excuse me. But no, they were trying to put me out for that. And after I got out, um, I was diagnosed with dysthemic disorder. I don't know if you know what that is. Basically, it's because I've been hit on the head too much. Uh, That's the cause, but anybody can really have it. 
That's um, also my doing. No, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, literally, well, literally, like when we would uh, train in the army, and it started in basic, I would get hit on the head fucking constantly. But um, like anytime I would get my bell rung in the B dock when Hutch and I would throw down or whatever, I wouldn't say shit because I'm like, well, no, I want to keep my job. I love my job. But it would get real hard to see outside and it'd be really bright and shit like that. But so dysthemic, dysthemic disorder, it's hard to pronounce, is I tell people it's when major depressive disorder moves in and gets annoying. But we're the ones that are at risk of being nonverbal and spoon fed in hospitals and wasting away. Um, a lot of us will waste away in our homes because we just don't have the energy to take care of ourselves or or even to kill ourselves because it just takes too much energy. Um, and I'm not suicidal or anything, you know, it's just, it's just it, I've had it for so long that I'll have little shitty waves, but it's always a constant state of not okay. Um, How do you fight that mentally? Like, what, if, what do you do? Like, it, it's exhausting. I have to, I have to do some kind of exercise. Like I tend to walk about five days a week for an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, so I'll get in a good walk. I used to lift really heavy, uh, for me, really heavy. So I'll, uh, it was a little bit too much. Uh, I almost hurt myself. I was benching 275 uh, at, a, at a max, and I was doing 250 for reps. And I was getting close to hurting myself because I was just pushing too fast. You know what? Uh, I need to exercise. I need to eat right. I can't drink rum or Jägermeister. So um, not in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's odd learning about foods that affect mental health. I can't have real cheddar cheese. I can only have the artificial stuff. Because wow. not only will I have nightmares at night, but for a few days afterwards, I will fucking hate everybody, and I'll have the angriest inner monologue. Uh, and it's just stupid, like fucking cheddar cheese. I love cheese. I know I'm lactose intolerant, but that doesn't stop me. But now I have to worry about slapping somebody in fucking the grocery store. You know? Wow. That's uh, but yeah, so uh, I have that and uh, the TBI, and I'm still fighting the VA on that. And I'm also autistic. I was diagnosed five years after I was discharged. So 2017 with, uh, it used to be called Asperger's syndrome. I don't know if they just call it like autism now or whatever, but they're always playing with names. Um, I'm glad I wasn't diagnosed when I was little because they used to call it uh, childhood schizophrenia. I don't hear voices. Yeah. I don't see people. That's a bullshit name. You're basically signing a death sentence for that fucking kid. Uh, but no, it's Asperger's. And a lot of people look at that as a gift because it's like, you, yeah, what you think is just like, it's yeah, really and, and awesome. I, and for me, it's fucking annoying because I'll look at uh, people like, "How are you surviving? You're a fucking idiot. You don't research decisions, and you'll you, still say somehow, it too. <laughs> you still somehow make it, yeah. and you're mildly successful. What the fuck is wrong with you?" And here I am. I obsess over every little thing. Um, I'll look at new. I have to look at people's faces and learn their little expressions uh, in order to kind of understand, okay, they did this expression and then they reacted that way. So that's their little quirk. Uh, I have to map everything like with, a, with the way that people stand, if their feet are pointed at me, uh, if they are like the pupil dilation, you know, if I can see it, uh, like if they see me and they are acting happy, but their pupils suddenly constrict, they're bullshitting me, you know, there's something wrong. They're actually mad or something. Um, when you were first keep... diagnosed, how did you take the news? Like It explained a lot. I was actually kind of happy okay. because it explained a lot, even when I was little, you know, why I didn't understand things, why I would um, get lost in books so much and disassociate. Uh, it, it just explained a lot. That's awesome. Um, so going back to your medical discharge, how did you find, run into that woman that like got you out and got you on honorable discharge? Well, she was, she actually, um, failed, you know, she was trying to help us. And so an ombudsman, what they are is they're supposed to take, there's supposed to be one on every base. 
and they're the only civilian on base that carries an equal rank to the nearest general in the region. So if there's a two star, then the civilian is equivalent to that two star and they take care of the medical for everybody. And the reason for the equivalent rank is they're supposed to be able to tell that general, you're fucking up. Yeah. You're doing the wrong thing and you need to fix it. And they're supposed to be go, able to go around that general and straight to Congress. Well, what was happening is General Petard was ignoring her and just throwing people out and he wasn't supposed to be doing that. Uh, so that was her whole failure, but it wasn't her fault. It was just General Petard screwing people over. Uh, and a lot of untreated soldiers that should not have been released into society were just let go. So I have no way of finding out whatever happened to the other 300 something, but I imagine a lot of them, a lot of them are not doing as well as I am. Yeah. And how was your transition other than that? Like what else did you have to deal with? Not getting... good, not good at all. Um, because I was halfway through a medical discharge, the VA had to finish that but they didn't they said no we have to redo everything we just have these records now so at least we have some kind of thing to start with so it took them another year to start paying me and i did the standard ptsd thing of looking like shit when i got out and not taking care of myself and being angry all the fucking time and confrontational um so nobody was hiring and i had to go to school and be around 18 year olds uh, mostly 18 year olds. I was going to get into that too because I knew you went to college. So, how yeah. did that go? It was not okay. It, most of the people um, were kind of standoffish. I would make occasional little friends here and there, but there were many instances where I would end up in real confrontations uh, with others. You know, it, it just wasn't good. And not every confrontation I want to say was bad. You know, some are just natural, you know, but some of them were because. I was too much of a fucking asshole. Uh, there is the biggest confrontation I ever had, I actually think was not my fault. I don't, I don't see it that way. And I don't see it in a negative in any way. Um, it was at UTEP in the library in the lobby. And there were these three athletes that were talking with this young lady who obviously wanted to leave. She was saying, excuse me, I want to go. And they circled her. And they were trying to talk with her and she, you know, you don't fucking do that. Yeah. So I walked over and I said, excuse me. And I helped her get out. Well, the guys got mad and they surrounded me. So I put my hand in my pocket and you remember that Smith and Wesson knife that I had that was curved. It looked like a claw. I had my hand on that. I still got it. And they saw me put my hand in my pocket. I didn't pull anything out, but one of them backed up and they said, you know what? Call 911. This guy's got a gun. I'm like you gotta be fucking kidding all right we're gonna do this shit so we're all standing there facing each other cops show up they're used to dealing with me you know they're like hey how's it going and uh they said so we gotta check i said cool i put my arms out and there and one of them laughed because he's like really you're gonna let us check you this time i'm like well they said i got a gun and I'm, i don't want y'all to shoot me so yeah you know because anyways previous interactions it didn't work with but um, they found my little knife and I explained, I didn't pull it out. You can check the cameras. you got like four or five facing us. Uh, but they're saying this because they got mad because I helped, you know, yada, yada. And the girl, she just wanted everything to go away. She was already anxious. She doesn't want her name on reports and shit. So I tried to press charges on the guys for saying this. And they said, well, we're going to press charges on him. Well, they're fucking UTEP athletes. They're college athletes. Uh, a Hispanic veteran with tattoos carrying a knife versus three athletes in Texas. I know what's going to happen. So we all walked away from that. But as we're leaving, I heard the, the campus police guy telling the, the guys there, like, y'all looked out because he could have fucking killed you. And they just kind of got cocky like college guys do. And he says, no. No, that guy served. I don't know where he's trained, what he knows, where he's been, but at the very least, he would have ended your time here. And that's when the smiles disappeared. And they're like, okay, okay, they got the idea. So, not all the confrontations are bad. Huh? Did the girl ever thank you for? No, she scurried off. You know, it's understandable. It's a scary situation. But, uh, 
Yeah, it's they're crazy. actually. Like, you know something's wrong. You know you're outnumbered, but doing the right thing, you know, it's like. Yeah, it's and it oh. sucks because you know you're going to fucking lose, but you got to try something. <laughs> That's crazy, man. It was honorable for you to do that, though. So did you um, um, did you graduate from that college? No, I'm at 89 credits right now. Um, oh. I kept getting burned out, honestly. Um, just the stress of dealing with not only classes and the confrontations, but also dealing with the BA. There were times in between semesters where I would literally spend 40 hours a week at the VA trying to walk things back and forth and deal with different people to get claims done. Um, so I just kept getting burned out. And so I, uh, I met my current girlfriend uh, and I traveled to China. And while I was out there, I said, you know what, I'm getting burned out too much. I need to get a job and I need to take a break from school because I don't get paid when I'm not in school other than the disability. Yeah. And so I decided, okay, well, April, I'm dropping classes. So that's what I did. And that was a couple of years ago. And then the pandemic happened while I was trying to find good work because you can find any minimum wage job, but I'm going to end up losing money taking that job. Mm -hmm. I need something that really can help out. So while I was looking for a job, pandemic happened. Nobody was hiring. Um, I had USA Jobs. I had Indeed. I had Glassdoor, all of it. And I didn't get something until... See, I applied for a behavioral tech job in March and they called me in June of this year and I finally got a job. So I started doing in-home teaching uh, for autistic kids. Nice. And so it's nice to be able to give back and actually help. Um, and I love working with kids because, you know, there's no bullshit. They're going to be honest with you. And if they like it, cool. And if they're not, they're going to fucking let you know. It's just nice. Um, so I like that job, but I found out after I lost my first client, which is a whole story in itself, uh, that there's a high client turnover rate. So there's a running joke in the field called spicy parents. Basically, these parents disagree with our methods of teaching. We have to be really gentle. And there's something that I really love that you should look up called tangible extinction. The military does it without even realizing it. Uh, but it's just a way of getting people to do things and to achieve goals. And, uh, and it, you keep them motivated by keeping th this vision of their goal or something that they want just out of reach. And you don't have to yell. You don't have to raise your voice. You don't have to spank anybody. And a lot of parents, they still have that tough love kind of belief. Well, my client was having a tantrum. And grandmother tried for half an hour to calm him down. Didn't work. I spent five minutes with the kid. And he's sitting next to me humming quietly. He's annoyed, but he's quiet. And he's ready to start kind of learning a little bit at least. And that didn't go over well. So grandmother said, well, we want somebody that knows Spanish. Great. You know, we're fine. So that was the reason why I lost that client. So. I decided, well, I need a full-time, good, steady paying job. Cool. What can I get now? Nothing. So I still have a little bit of my post 9-11 GI Bill left. I went to um, Phoenix truck driving school on post and signed up for that. And I have my final test tomorrow. Um, I'm already halfway done with it. I passed like this pre-trip inspection where we have to memorize the truck and this has to be in this condition, that, that, whatever. There's like 140 something different things. And so I passed all that and I have to do maneuvers and the driving test. And I have my CDL. That's awesome, man. I've seen like videos of you and uh, when you're doing that and hat yeah. off to you, bro. Like one thing I hated about the army was driving. So that's one thing I'll never do. So how is it doing that course? Is it like- you It's interesting. Driving? Yeah. You start understanding a lot of the things that you see that piss off normal drivers. Like, why is this semi truck stopped behind an accident? Why doesn't it just go around? Well, we're required to stop behind accidents to block the road and protect the, the lane so that emergency responders can get there. 
That's yeah. it's law, like interstate law. Um, why sometimes they straddle lanes and piss people off and things like this, you know, and, and, and especially why it takes them so long to get to intersections. Um, I'll coast up in fourth gear doing 10 miles an hour, 12 miles an hour for uh, maybe 50 yards. And I see people behind me just not happy. But this is because you have this thing behind you that can weigh up to 80,000 pounds yeah. without a permit. You know, you can have 110,000 pounds with a permit or something. Um, and you're trying to get around this 90 degree corner that some people in suburbans can't fucking make. And we got to do it in this long ass thing. So uh, you start learning a lot of those little details. Um, double clutching every time is vitally important because you can wear out the transmission a lot quicker if you don't do it. Downshifting, you cannot coast. It is illegal to coast in a semi truck. Oh. So if, if you're going downhill, you have to downshift and leave it there because it's, it's never going to even pull out a gear if you're going downhill. Um, but if you miss that gear, if there's an officer around and they don't hear your engine, they can give you just this monster ticket. Wow. Now, are you going to be driving um, coast to coast or is this going to be a local thing? Not yet. Right now, it's got to be local. Um, yeah. My daughter has to finish her driver's license and she's got to spend six months driving with me before she can drive on her own. Oh, okay. So uh, it's she'll be graduating by about the time where I can start just leaving for a week or three, driving somewhere. And there are oil fields nearby too. So I would like to do that instead for at, at least a year to get some real money. Uh, and it, it's a lot of hours, you know, you're talking 60, 70 hours a week and then two days mandatory day off. It's like a day and a half, but um, it's great money. You can get starting pay somewhere around 75 to $110,000 a year. And I can save up enough for my own truck and start doing coast to coast on myself, do the owner operator thing. So that'd be awesome. Cause I'm like, if your daughter wanted to go, you guys can like, yeah, yeah. See the well, she won't, but yeah, she could. She's yeah. already been accepted to like three different universities. So awesome. uh, I expect that by fall of next year, she'll be off somewhere. Nice. That's a, uh, what are the three universities? One is, uh, let's see, it's New Mexico State university then university of arizona and i i forget the other one uh, i think it's something here in texas it might actually be utep uh she doesn't want to go here though. So it was it was mostly just to get into ut yeah. the, the ut system because she really likes west texas university also um but there's uh university uh, i think it's ut austin that she's interested in as well um i told her you know just for good measure you're going to write up something and you're going to put in for Oxford just in case, yeah. you know, and I'll pay the whatever fee it is. It's like a hundred bucks or something. I don't know. But uh, we got to laugh about that because like nobody gets into fucking Oxford, but sure. You know, nice. apply it. She can you know, apply just, anyway. And jumping around again, you mentioned going to China. How was that? Yeah. Um, so my girlfriend lives out there. We met on eHarmony. Nice. So it turns out if you're on eHarmony and you find the max distance, I think it's like 5,000 miles or something like that, and you put that in there, you can meet people around the world. We matched up and we started chatting and video chatting online. And a few months later, I flew out to China and out in uh, Shenzhen, which is right next to Hong Kong. Like they're literally, uh, there's a waterway with a bridge in between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And there's something like 11 million people out there or something. And so we hung out for an entire week. Longest first date I ever had. It was great. We went to uh, Hong Kong Disney. And that's where I think in one of those pictures you see uh, my Doctor Strange Disney shirt that looks like an anime kind of design. I got that there. And then uh, there's a picture of her with a little uh, pink umbrella. And that's us at Disney there. But How was yeah, it like being you know, in China? Like I it was, it was amazing. You know, the people are really wonderful. Um, the street food is great. The only time I got sick, because people always say, "Well, you know, you're going to end up shitting yourself with food out there. It's all poison." No, I, it was prepackaged bullshit that you can buy here. It was some ramen thing in the in the fucking hotel, and that 
cleaned me out for a day. It destroyed me. It was horrible. <laughs> but other than that, all the food we got was great. Um, I had durian pizza. You do you know what a durian is? No. Oh right. wait, durian it's, is that fruit that stinks really bad, right? It's the one that smells like rotting socks and dead people. Yeah. And it looks like a spiky bowling ball. What does it taste like though? It it actually tastes like a meat custard. Oh. It's really good. It's delicious. Just don't smell it. But I had uh, durian pizza, which was great. And I had durian cake. So if you, the more you cook durian, the less it smells. So I didn't even smell the cake at all. And it still tastes absolutely great. Um, I bought durian popsicles for my daughter here because you can kind of get a little bit of durian in the US. Yeah. It's not much. And if you buy a, a real durian, it's like half of one is $50, 60 It's fucking expensive because you can't, it's hard to transport in airplanes. Um, but my daughter tried it and she immediately uh, hated it. She ate it because it's interesting and she got to brag to her friends, but she hated it. You know, All right. uh, Durian actually brought down a plane once. It, it made it do an emergency landing because it was wrapped badly in a shipment. <laughs> And they couldn't handle it anymore. So they called in an emergency landing and it brought down that whole fucking cargo plane. Um, I That's I, on my bucket list just to try that because I hear about it. It's like, it's like there's signs that like you cannot have it and stuff because of how bad it smells. Is it yeah, really it's that not allowed in government buildings or hotels. Yeah. You, you cannot get rid of the smell. To me, it smells like if you can imagine a dead person wearing socks for a week, it's like that. But if you hold your nose and you just eat it, it tastes like meat custard, and it's great. That's insane. Yeah, I definitely got to add that to the list. So what else? What other things did you do in China that was pretty cool to check out? You know, we walked around a lot, and uh, the people were really nice. Um, like I said, the food was great. Um, it, you learn that it's not what you see on TV. You know, the, the, they don't hate all of us. Okay, governments can disagree all they want. Governments are governments, whatever. The people were all really pleasant, and a lot of them liked seeing me there. Like, oh my God, Lao Wai, Lao Wai, a foreigner. And they would want to take a picture with me, or because they don't see many uh, Lao Wai, especially uh, non white ones. You know, a black person, there's got to be three in China. Uh, I'm Hispanic and I tan quickly. So, um, you know, it's like, wow, there's, this, this is amazing and different. Was so there, there was even a, a kid in or no say what was there any places you felt unsafe in or anything or not not at all okay. not at all i felt totally safe um the exchange rate was impressive because it's it's like a 6.7 or something to one uh, for uh, yeah the exchange rate it was just really nice best margarita i have ever had was at a pizza hut in fucking china wow I'm not bullshitting. It was blue, best goddamn margarita I have ever had. <laughs> That's insane. It's, I'm right up against Mexico. You would think we would have great margaritas here. Yeah. No, it was at a pizza hut in China. <laughs> All right. So, Ortiz, um, what are the things that I would definitely wanted to cover before we finish up? Um, what are what short term, long term goals are you working on right now? Uh, you cut out short term and long term? Yeah, goals are okay. you working on now? So short term is just to graduate and be able to fucking pay bills. You know, yeah. long term is I would like to be able to uh, get a truck and drive cross country, and my girlfriend and I would like to get married, um, but there's a uh, financial boundary because China still has dowries, and it's it once the communist government took over, it's no longer. Uh, a pig and a fruit basket like it literally used to be a pig in a fruit basket and now it's a hundred thousand won uh, y-u-a-n not w-o-a-n w-o-n which is roughly fifteen thousand wow. dollars and if you don't pay it she and i can still get married here but china won't recognize it because her father has to sign off at a government building saying yes he can marry her you know so we have, we would have to do that. And uh, then I can get her here and then she can just drive around the country with me. You know, we'll get a, a sleeper cab, hopefully something with a little restroom and, uh, and a shower in it. You know, otherwise we'll be using the ones it loves. Uh, 
and they're just it's it's one of her dreams too to travel across the u.s and see it and after a while when we get uh when she gets old and when i'm just a little older you know because i'm already fucking 40 uh, we can we can travel across china you know we can save up and see what's out there has she ever been over here yet no no um she really hasn't traveled much but she's a lot younger than me anyway you know she's 24 oh so, okay so her travels uh, even across china are uh maybe a day and a half by train and that you can't even cross texas in that at the speed of the the normal train out there you know, not the high speed one so it, it's it's not much travel and you've been on this earth 40 years ortiz what kind of a good advice would you give that you've learned along the way that you'd want everyone to know like chill the fuck out <laughs> I love it. god damn it people are too confrontational too ready to get into somebody's face too ready to risk it all you know fighting as an adult literal fighting is not like fighting as a kid and uh, like you, you don't get to bounce back so easily so at UTEP a kid literally tried to get into my face over this. So we were finishing up a physics course and uh, this guy questioned like, well, what happens if an airplane needs to back up but the little bus thing isn't there to push it back? And I said, oh, they throw it in reverse and, uh, and it pushes them back. And he's like, what? And I said, yeah, the engines have little flaps that open and it redirects the air and it pushes it back. And, and he disagreed. Like, okay, well, you can find it on video, YouTube real quick. Um, and they literally just open up flaps. They're called, uh, I think, reversers. And it shoves the air forward. They're used for almost every jumbo jet. When they land, you'll see the, the shell of the engine open and it's shoving air forward. Uh, well, the guy got mad and he said, no, no, it's got to be fake. And he literally got in my face over that. And I'm like, dude, you, you're willing to, to, you're willing to, risk it all and die on this little hill that comment got the cops called campus police showed up and he said he's gonna make him die on a hill god damn it even the kids even the, the cops were like no it's an expression it means you're a fucking idiot yeah. they didn't curse at them but they're like you, you, it, it's just an expression calm down too many people are willing to risk it all over the stupidest shit and you need to relax. Just yeah. breathe. It'll be okay. If you don't do, if you don't agree on something, fuck. Yeah, my big thing is one day at a time, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ortiz, thank you for being on the Absolute BS podcast, man. It's thank awesome you for having me. You. And uh, yeah, it's great to see you again, man. It's been a while, yeah, you too. dude. You're like a vampire. You don't age. You look exactly as I first saw you, bro. <laughs> yeah, I've looked this way since high school. Yeah. All right, buddy. You take care, man. You have a good one. Bye.